Hey, thanks for being here today. Thanks for watching at home. And uh, you know what? This is a weekend we celebrate freedom. And uh, we have so many things to celebrate in this country, and I hope you've been able to do that. Uh, hopefully the fireworks didn't keep you up all night last night, uh, but I know they were banging around here for uh, quite a while. And uh, you know what? We, we, we gather today to celebrate freedom as well. Uh, just the freedom that Christ has given to us uh, from sin in our lives, from being slaves to sin and all of those things, we come today to celebrate that. And so I hope you're ready to do that and uh, to just lift your voices in song and then just open your heart and open your mind uh, to the Word of God today as we look at Daniel chapter 4. If you want to go ahead and be turning to that, uh, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But for right now, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our worship team and they will lead us in a time where we just celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The psalmist in Psalm 9 says... I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. And that's what we're here to do today. Give praise to God. Let's sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy.
pray with me. Father God, summer will soon be over and many will be heading into a new and uncertain school year. As a mother and a teacher, this certain uncertainty will weigh heavy on my heart, as I'm sure it does for many others. Teachers and families alike will have fears and frustrations. Some will worry that we won't do enough, while others will worry that we will do too much. Teachers will struggle to teach curriculum and build relationships with students from six feet apart or maybe even further. Parents will worry about consistency and quality of education in this limited environment. Every one of us will worry about keeping children and families safe from COVID-19. So Father, in the days ahead, we pray for discernment to do what is right. We pray that you will give us um, adaptability, strength, understanding, 
and the love to get through this together. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Bridget, thank you so much uh, for that prayer. I think that's got to be a prayer that we're praying uh, for a long time. Uh, as school starts and as things start to pick up again, uh, just what does it look like, God? Just help us, uh, you know, direct us through each and every step of that. So thank you uh, so much. You know, the list of people that God has humbled throughout the years, whether he did it directly or indirectly, is enormous. And if you look at the results of those humbling experiences, what happened in people's lives afterwards, I'm sure that you will find some where the people went right back to their prideful, narcissistic, arrogant manner and probably even had a little less regard for God than they did before that experience. But then again, there are some who I think we can look at and say that it turned out better after they were humbled by God. You know, I think we look at the Apostle Peter in the New Testament as proof of that and how that can happen. <clears throat> Prior uh, to that rooster crowing, he was as cocky as that little rooster <laughs> before it crowed and reminded him of exa- he did exactly what Jesus said that he would do. But I think all of us would agree that after the fact, Peter was probably one of the greatest leaders in the history of Christ's church. So, You might say a serving of humble pie served Peter well. Sometimes I think it's hard to draw the line between being humbled and being humiliated. But there's no question at all that what God wants for all of his followers is that we would be humble. If you need to be reminded of that, turn to Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where the, the prophet says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to do what? Walk humbly with your God. You know, growing up, I don't remember very often my parents telling me that I was being prideful. But I do remember them having a phrase that as I look at it now, it might have been a synonym. Their phrase was, you're getting a little too big for your britches. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? You know, I I, I don't know exactly what all it meant, but I do know that whenever I heard that phrase, there was usually some humiliation (laughs) that came shortly after that. Did I like it at the time? No. But you know what? I'm really glad that from time to time, when I got too big for my britches, I was put on a crash diet of humility. You know, maintaining a humble persona is not easy for most people, and sometimes it it takes a lot of work, and sometimes it even takes other people that we trust being willing to help us. I found a post back on Forbes.com from January 25th, 2017, when one of their editors, Kathy Caprino, interviewed a guy named Bill Treasurer, whose title is, catch this, Chief Encouragement Officer. Get that? He's the CEO the chief encouragement officer for a company called Giant Leap Consulting. And it's a group that works with a lot of major businesses trying to improve leadership inside them. Now, uh, Caprino asked this question. She said, how can leaders develop both healthy self-esteem and self-confidence, but also keep those potentially huge egos and narcissism in check? Now, I probably would have just asked the question, how do leaders remain humble, okay? But she asked it a whole lot more smart-sounding than I would have. But I really liked Treasurer's answer that she gave to him. He says this, first of all, leaders need to be keenly aware of how easy it is to get seduced into the thinking that you're special because you're in a position of leadership. He says, to keep from getting too caught up in yourself, I suggest having at least one chief ego deflator. Every leader should have at least one person whose job it is to call the leader out when necessary. The CED acts as sort of a conscience, ensuring that when the leader makes a decision, it's focused on serving the interests of the organization and its people, not satisfying the leader's ego needs. He said self-deception is dangerous to all people, but most especially leaders. And he says leaders need to surround themselves with truth tellers. Now, has anybody ever heard that, ch- that phrase, chief ego deflator, before, CEDs? 
I think that was just another role that my, my parents played, okay, uh, in my life whenever I got too big for my britches. And today we're going to look at a king in the Bible who got too big for his britches, and the true God of heaven was the one who became that chief ego deflator in his life. We're continuing our journey through the, book, the Old Testament book of Daniel where we're looking at how did Daniel and his three friends survive all of these changes that took place in their life. And what we're seeing time and time again is that it was they trusted in the one true God of heaven. Today we're ready for chapter 4 of the book of Daniel. And I don't know if you know this, but chapter 4 of Daniel is different than any other chapter in the Bible. Like, does anybody know what that is? Chapter 4 of Daniel is the only book in the Bible, the only chapter, excuse me, the only chapter in the Bible written by a pagan. It was written by someone who was not a follower of God. We've already seen that he worshipped many gods and he was prideful and he was arrogant and all of those things. But you know what? I think it just goes to show that this chapter is included and it just shows that God will do whatever he needs to to help people become a follower of him. The story is told, like I said, by King Nebuchadnezzar. um, And I think what happens is that God is trying to get his attention throughout his lifetime. And if you look at all of the things that God did, for instance, we saw last week how he witnessed a pre-incarnate miracle of Jesus. He saw Jesus do something that pretty much nobody else could see except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in that fiery furnace. And God also allowed him to create a scenario that only Daniel could solve with God's help. Again, seeing God's work there. And the fact that Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were in positions of leadership, God put them there. So that King Nebuchadnezzar would be exposed to him and his greatness. The jury's still out if you read on Nebuchadnezzar whether or not he truly became a follower of God or not. But you know what? He definitely was humbled by the chief ego deflator because he had some pretty serious pride issues. So let's look together at chapter 4 today. And if you want to view chapter 4 as just a long letter where Nebuchadnezzar tells his story of humiliation. And so it begins with this in chapter one, or chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. With just his name, King Nebuchadnezzar, meaning this is coming from him. And he says, to the people, nations, and men of every language who live in all of the worlds, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His domain endures from generation to generation. And that's a pretty huge introduction for this king, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's attached to the end of chapter 3 where we hear some, him, him saying some praise to God for the, the rescue of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But then he goes in and talks about this dream that he had. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So what he did is he repeated the same thing he did after his first dream, which was he called in all of his wise guys to try to solve the problem. They couldn't, so then he calls in Daniel to interpret it for him. Now, if you look at the timeline of this, okay, between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, most scholars would say it was about 30 years. It didn't happen one day to the next. There was a 30-year gap in between these two events of the, of the three being in the fiery furnace and Daniel then having to interpret this, interpret this dream. So... Daniel's probably about 50 years old now. And Daniel comes before the king who has experienced a lot of stuff in his life. A lot of God trying to get his attention. So then when the king has Daniel before him, in verse 9, he says this. Belshazzar, which was Daniel's new name, chief of the magicians, who basically were just dream interpreters. I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. So here's my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed, the king said. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was was enormous, and the tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was fruit for all. 
Under it, the beasts of the fields found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. And from it, every living creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, of the, a, messenger a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he called out in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. And then he says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man to that being given to the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The Holy One declares the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. The king says, this is my dream. Now, Daniel, tell me what it means. For none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can because the spirit of the Holy God is in you. Do you remember your dreams when you have them? And do you remember them in such graphic detail as to what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed and could convey to Daniel? I think the reason that happened was God was trying to get his attention. And I would say this, if we remember in graphic detail the dreams that we have and we can share that with somebody else, it just might be God speaking to us, trying to convey a message to us. Verse 19 says that when Daniel heard this dream from the king, he was taken back. In fact, when he first realized what it meant, it says he was terrified. And, and that leads a lot of scholars to believe that, you know what, probably some of these other interpreters knew what the king's dream meant. It's not that hard to figure out. But they were afraid to tell the king what they, knew, what they felt that it meant. So here's a point that I want us to get from this. That when we trust in the one true God, he gives us the courage to speak the truth, even, even when others are afraid to do so. When we trust in the one true God, he'll give us the courage to speak the truth, even when others are afraid to do so. We need people like that today, do we not? We need people who are willing to speak the truth. But let me just add a word of warning to those of us who feel like we may have been called to do that. Make sure that we're sharing God's truth and not just ours or someone else's opinion. Daniel wasn't afraid to tell the truth, even though he knew that the message was life-changing for King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar's dream was all about him. And it's, I think it was God's way of saying, hey, king, you've gotten a little too big for your britches, and what needs to happen is you need to be humbled here for a while, and you need to understand that I truly am the almighty God of heaven. So Daniel explained to, explained to Nebuchadnezzar that he was the tree, and his kingdom was the one that was taking care of everyone, but it was going to be cut but you can't miss the fact that there was a stump that was left and there were roots that were left amongst the grass. So why? So that it could be redeemed and restored if the king was willing to do a couple of things. Renounce his sins and be kind to the oppressed is what Daniel says. Can we just really dwell on the point that this is Nebuchadnezzar telling this story? I mean, here's the guy who was one of the most arrogant, narcissistic men. He created a 90-foot statue of himself and ordered people to worship. And now he's having to tell this story of humiliation? For me, what that says is that God never gives up on anyone. No matter how far they may seem to be away from him, he's willing to do whatever it takes in order for them to, to come back or to follow him. Here's the thing, and he didn't do this with 
Nebuchadnezzar either. He didn't force him. He didn't override his free will. He allowed him to choose whether or not he would follow him. Now, granted, seven years of lycanthropy is a little more aggressive on God's part than what we see him trying to convince other people to follow him in the Bible. But then again, not everybody was as strong-willed as King Nebuchadnezzar. Has anybody ever heard the phrase lycanthropy before? Okay, Joe, we need to go a couple more slides forward. Um, has anyone ever heard lycanthropy before? Okay, one more. There it is. Lycanthropy, by definition, is a form of madness involving the illusion of being an animal, usually a wolf with co corresponding altered behavior. In the psychiatry world, lycanthropy is a rare psychiatric syndrome where people grunt, claw, and feel their body is covered with hair and their nails are elongated. Anybody ever watch werewolf movies? That's where this comes from. Lycanthropy is the description of this idea that werewolves exist or can exist. That's what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. His mind was transformed from that of a human into the mind of an animal. And he even tells that story as he describes what happens. As he goes, from, he goes from the first person to the third person, but this is still Nebuchadnezzar talking in verse 28. And he says, all of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he said, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The king, the words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what the decree, this is the decree to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately. What had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails were like the claws of a bird. A couple things I find fascinating. Lycanthropy can also take on the characteristics of a bird, which is exactly what God describes here or Nebuchadnezzar describes happened to him. And verse 29, note when this happened. One year after he had the dream. The king was admiring all of his accomplishments, and this voice came from heaven. In the moment of his pridefulness. So here's a point for us to consider. God's timing is always Do you think after Nebuchadnezzar had the dream and Daniel interpreted it for him, he was conscious of things going on in his life? My guess is he had constant Manny and Petties, okay? And he kept his hair really short. Because as he looked in the mirror every day, he wanted to see if things were starting to happen according to that dream. But over a period of time, probably what happened was that went from the front of his brain to the back of his brain. And he became less concerned and less worried about being humbled to the point that in the midst of his arrogance, in that moment, God spoke to him and humbled him. It's just part of God's perfect timing because if you look at when this happened in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, if you look at the timeline of his life and how he ruled, this seven years started probably about eight years before his reign ended meaning that he had to live through this seven years of humiliation, and yet just like that dream promised, just like Daniel said, he could be restored if he was willing to repent. And he did. And he had about a year whereby he could restore himself to his leadership and be the leader of his kingdom. Has God ever humbled you at just the right time? Maybe he hasn't turned us into werewolves. 
to get us to that point, but has there ever been a time in your life where you feel God has just humbled you? I can look back in my life, and I think one of the times that was most memorable is when we were living in Indianapolis. And I was working and leading a retirement community and a nursing home, and I had just become an elder at Traders Point Christian Church, and things were just going really, really well in life. In fact, the state surveyors had just come in and done a, a, a survey of our facility, and they walked out and said, we can't find anything wrong with your facility. Now, they just didn't look hard enough, I'll tell you that. But we had a perfect survey, which was unheard of. And I began thinking, wow, this is pretty good. I remember going to a Wednesday evening prayer service at, at Traders Point, and sitting there, and I, and I just had this voice in the back of my head just kind of saying, Dave, don't become prideful. Remain humble. And so what I did was I prayed to God, and I said, God, please humble me. Can I tell you, never pray that prayer? <laughs> or at least don't mean it if you do. Because when you pray and you ask God to do that, he'll do it if he knows that's what needs to be done. And it wasn't too far after that that things just started to fall apart. I made bad decisions when it came to leadership at the facility involving staff issues. The, the, the surveyors came in again, and this time they just ripped us to shreds. They just fine-toothed comb, finding every dot that wasn't crossed and every T that, or every dot that wasn't dotted and every T that wasn't crossed in documentation. It was just no fun at all. Not anything close to what nursing homes just went through with the, uh, the coronavirus, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to compare that. But it was miserable. I remember crying out to God, okay, God, that's enough. Deaf ears. God did not say, okay, Dave, you've had enough. He just kept things coming to the point where there was no other part of me that could cry out and just say, God, please help me get through this. You're the one who's in control. And you know what? When I got to that point, things started to come together. And, and even though we left that facility to go start the church in Connecticut, I am convinced that that experience at that facility at that time helped prepare me to help start a church. And so again, God's timing was always perfect, and the way he did it, I think, was perfect. Look at the end of chapter 4 of Daniel. I can relate to his words, and maybe if you've been through a humiliating experience, you can as well. Nebuchadnezzar says this, At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and my splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and, because, and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, get this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right. And all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, here's the clincher, he is able to humble. What an amazing transformation from this man who was so prideful and narcissistic that he commanded people to worship him. But after being humbled, what does he do? He acknowledges God for who he is. You know what? So this is the final point that I want to make from this passage this morning. And it's simply this. God humbles us to elevate us, not punish us. God will humble us 
to elevate us, to lift us up, and not to punish us. James said basically the same thing in chapter 4, verse 10, when he said, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, who probably knows this as well as anybody, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. I think it comes down to this. When we need to be humbled, if we're not willing to do it ourselves, God will do it. And we need to be willing to accept that. You know, this weekend we're celebrating 244 years of freedom in the United States. And let me say this, I I love our country. But over some years, I have been concerned about what I sense as being some arrogance and pridefulness in our nation. And history has shown that any country who becomes arrogant and prideful, that usually leads to a decline in their faithfulness to God. Just look at the nation of Israel. Why were they in Babylonian captivity for seven years? Because they had become unfaithful to God. And so God humbled them, or some would say humiliated them, so that they would trust in him again. So here's speculation on my part. That's all that it is. I wonder if part of all the changes that are going on in America today isn't us being humbled as a nation so that we will once again learn to trust in the God of heaven more than we trust in the men and women who lead this country. If for a period of time we are humiliated and we will emerge as a nation that is more focused on God, I say, bring it on. I am willing to endure many years of being uncomfortable. I may even... Consider becoming a vegetarian. Don't hold me to that, but I might consider it. But if all of this happens, and all we do is drift further and further away from God, then I only have one prayer left. And that is, Jesus, come quickly and take us to the next chapter of eternity. Whatever the case is, and I'm not smart enough to know, but whatever the case is, I pray that those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ will place our trust in the one true God of heaven, regardless of what happens around us. If we're being humbled, then may we get to the point where we will praise God for who he is. One of the ways that we are reminded of just how much God has done for us and a reason for us to praise him is through communion. And so, those of you who are watching, if you want to grab those emblems now, those of you who are in the service, if you want to grab those emblems that are in front of you in the seat, the worship team is going to come and they're going to sing a song that will prepare us for a time. Matt will come and lead us in a devotional And then we'll take those emblems together. It's all about us trusting in the God of heaven more than anyone else or anything else on this earth. So may this time of communion be that reminder. Change. 
Thank you again for being a part of our service, whether at home or here uh, at the church. Just a couple of announcements that I would ask you to, to, to make note of. Uh, one is an invitation to a bridal shower uh, for Allison Ayers is back on the bulletin board, as well as was in the newsletter this week. It's going to be held on uh, July the 18th at 2 o'clock here at the church. You know what? I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the first bridal shower we've had with COVID-19 guidelines, Okay. Uh, so it's going to be a little different, uh, just because we do feel the need, and Barb and, and the family just wants to be very careful uh, to make sure that everybody is protected, and so there are some guidelines that will be followed. It's really important, if you're planning on being a part of that shower, uh, that you RSVP to Barb as quickly as possible, because once we hit 50, that takes it into a whole new realm of things, and so they just need to know how many people are coming. Also, <clears throat> if you'd like to go in on purchasing a gift uh, for Allison, uh, you can see Tracy, and uh, she'd be willing to, to get you lined up there uh, to help contribute towards maybe something that's a little larger uh, so that you don't have to go uh, and look for stuff by yourself. So that's on July the 18th here at the church. Uh, and encourage all the ladies uh, to be able to be a part of that. I was told that uh, men would have been invited if it wasn't for COVID-19. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that, but uh, that's what I was told, so I'm going to repeat it, okay? The other, the other thing is <clears throat> we go from bridal shower to baby, Okay. Uh, baby bottle boomerang, okay? Uh, Lo Loving Arms uh, Pregnancy Center is doing that. Hopefully, you're able to go online this week and make a contribution. Uh, I put the challenge out there to any other church that watches this and to South Fork. Uh, we're going to win this competition, okay? Uh, this church, this little country church, is going to give more money uh, to help the needs of those who are in pre uh, have pre uh, pregnancy concerns that are being helped by Loving Arms. And so uh, help me keep my word, Okay. Uh, I appreciate uh, your willingness to donate. If you have any questions, see Kathy, and she'll be glad to, um, to answer any questions that you have. I think that's it, and uh, thank you for spending part of your July 4th weekend with us, and um, I hope and pray that God keeps us safe and that God keeps us humble uh, so that we can continue to give praise and celebrate his goodness and his greatness. Would you just sing one more song with us as we uh, close today? And uh, I'm going to break all of the COVID-19 guidelines uh, myself and ask you, you know what, you've sat for a long time. Let's sing this last song standing and uh, with a little celebration in our voices. Okay, let's stand and sing. And all the people said amen. How many of you um, grew up in a church where if, if the preacher or anyone said something that they liked, they all said amen? I think some of us grew up in a time when we said that, and I think the service that we've had today, we all need to say amen. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sing that. All the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Thanks to the Lord, His love never ends.
right. Have a great week.